Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Performing Labor. My name is Rob Simons, and I am your host. This podcast features interviews with accomplished performing musicians who are doing interesting and creative work from within performing arts institutions and outside of them. We'll unpack their training, their practice, and their careers, how they got started, how they stay sharp, and their ambitions for the future. And it's my hope that these interviews will provide value no matter where you are on your musical journey. If you're thinking about a career in music, if you're in music school now, a working musician, or if you're a music lover and just curious to learn more. For this episode, I talk with Assistant Principal Oboe and English Horn of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra and faculty member at Indiana University's Jacobs School of Music, Roger Rowe. I've known Roger for about 15 years now, and I can say that all those formal titles only begin to capture Roger's impact as a colleague, activist, mentor, and independent thinking artist citizen. But before I continue, between when we recorded this conversation and when it was published, the Indianapolis Symphony released some disheartening news that I think is important to address. Here is a quote from the musician's press release. After several weeks of negotiations to receive back pay owed to the musicians, our management, as a condition of payment of wages already owed, demanded vastly expanded media rights to musician-related content. Management further insisted on the right to use that content long after the furloughing of musicians and the cutting off of benefits. The only assistance management is offering towards healthcare is a one-time stipend to each musician, equal to roughly two weeks of COBRA coverage for the average ISO family plan. Management has given no indication when the furlough will end or benefits restored. The musician's labor agreement expires September 6th. I will say up front that I have very fond feelings for the ISO. My wife was a member of the orchestra for 12 seasons, and I have many friends there. I can't pretend to be wholly impartial on this. But if you'll allow me a little history and some perspective. It's been almost a decade since the ISO's management and board last proposed transformationally regressive cuts. And the thing is, until then, the ISO had a well-deserved reputation for cautious governance and growth. Some might say too cautious. Maybe leaving some of their potential on the table in that trade-off. And that's what made 2012 and make this month's race to the bottom so unexpected. The stakeholders who toiled in service of the long-term values that make the ISO the ISO believe those values were held institutionally wide. They were not. In truth, few institutions had the antibodies to wholly defend against short-term thinking, especially in a crisis. But I would argue that's where it matters the most. During the Great Recession, around 2009, I learned firsthand, as a member of the Phoenix Symphony's negotiating committee, about facing an immediate crisis, but continuing to infuse the process with long-term thinking, when the other side saw expediency in dismantling the work of previous generations. The millions of dollars donated, the countless hours volunteered, the gains and sacrifices of your predecessors, all laid out for disposal. Orchestras, because of their longevity, have a huge debt to their predecessors. My group, the Rochester Philharmonic, is about to celebrate its centennial season. The ISO was formed in 1930. Yes, there is an obligation to conserve what came before, and yes, there is an obligation to use scarce resources wisely, but without a vision for a future of growth and greater service, the institutional responsibility is incomplete. In the interview, we talked about Indianapolis's urban renaissance and how it was decades in the making, the result of generations of skilled leadership, both public and private, target setting, and achievement. I love this story. When former Indianapolis Mayor Bill Hudnut died in the 1990s, his Washington Post obituary said of his early days in office nearly 30 years before, quote, Downtown Indianapolis has become so desolate that men with shotguns hunted pigeons on Sundays, among the empty buildings and along the trash-strewn canal. And one of those empty buildings downtown was the derelict Circle Theater. It became the Hilbert Circle Theater when the Indianapolis Symphony renovated it and has called it home since the early 80s. It's a platform on which incalculable benefits were generated, be they economic externalities or authentic human enjoyment and enrichment. Indianapolis is now a vibrant city, a network of sports, biotech, manufacturing, pharmaceuticals, startups, philanthropic foundations, and the arts. And as Roger points out, the ISO was not just an early mover 35 years ago, but continues to adapt its offerings and serves a wide spectrum of Hoosiers through pops, classical, happy hour, 
outdoor summer concerts, and its signature long-running and wildly popular Yuletide celebration. We covered a lot of ground in this conversation and could have easily kept going. We touched on his childhood and education in and around the Dallas-Fort Worth area, studying with the late and legendary John Mack of the Cleveland Orchestra, and his 20-plus years in ISO, and the many lessons learned along the way. It's impossible to account for all the spillover effects an orchestra member like Roger has. There is the simple-seeming but often overlooked value of bringing new hires into the fold quickly, and the trickier but deeply important work of surfacing an audition committee's values and instilling them into the process, or the spontaneous response of picking up his instrument to play for the people cleaning up their city after a night of protests, police violence, and vandalism. He asks how large organizations might empower their employees to be more expressive artists and to interrogate their collective place in civic life. Please enjoy this interview. Roger Rowe, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Uh, We are recording this in early early June, excuse me, and most of us have been out of concerts for a couple months now. And I started this podcast amidst COVID-19 and each time we've had some amount of conversation about the response to it, the institutional response, the individual response to it. But now we're also going through another shared experience of nationwide protests around police brutality. But first I'd like to hear about how the ISO reacted to the health crisis. Well, it was first week of March and mm-hmm. I think first week of March, maybe the second week of March we were playing Mahler 5, we're doing a music director search. And so we had a young, really good conductor that we were super excited about. And he got to conduct all the rehearsals. We even rehearsed the Corn Gold Violin Concerto one rehearsal. And then um, I'm on the orchestra committee. So we had been meeting with our CEO to kind of ask about, looks like things are starting to shut down around the country. Do you know what's going on? And he said, well, we're in close contact with the governor's office and we're really trying to, to determine what's safe and what's not safe. We certainly don't want to cancel concerts, but we will if we are required to by the governor, but we don't know. And then it was kind of crazy from Thursday to Friday. I think that's the timeline. It turned from, yeah, we're probably going to have this weekend's concerts too. Well, they just canceled the Big Ten tournament that's being played down the street. And it's not even that they're doing the Big Ten tournament just without an audience. They're canceling the Big Ten tournament. So we all kind of turned to each other and said, if they're canceling sports, then Mahler 5 is very likely not going to happen. Um, so sure enough, that's exactly what happened. The governor said everything of that size is not going to take place this weekend. So it was actually really interesting. Um, I came in the next day with our principal trumpet player and our principal horn player, and we just recorded them playing solo passages from the Mahler. Because first of all, we knew they'd be super disappointed not to get to do it. And we thought, well, those would be really powerful to post just with an empty hall behind them. So we did that the next day and like made a video of me washing my hands and did some things like that and then left the hall and um, hadn't been back until I played at the backstage door last week. Were those videos the ones that the Indie Star picked up? Yeah. Well, and we've been in the Indie Star a couple of times. We did a, several virtual ISO, we call it music in a time of distance. So we've done the thing that lots of other orchestras have done. Of um, We've done it through the musicians of the ISO social media pages. Um, we played second movement of Beethoven 8, kind of as a joke, because that's like inspired by the metronome. So we thought this would be easy to do. <laughs> and then... Uh, We did the opening of the Largo of the New World Symphony, also that I got to do. And um, so, yeah, we've been producing our own material for quite some time. And so once we shut down, we immediately went in and said, let's let's get recordings of Conrad and Rob playing solos from the Mahler. So the Indy Star has featured us. The local TV channels have too. You know, they try to keep up with what the artists in the city are doing during this time when we can't perform on stages. It seems like the relationship with the media in town is really good with you guys right now. Is that, has it picked up because of the COVID crisis or was it just always building? 
Um, it's been building, you know, it's, when you say with us guys, you mean with the orchestra as an institution? Well, just I see, I, I follow you guys, obviously, and I keep up to date with what you're doing. And I feel like I see really fantastically well-produced media um, and being pushed by the major outlets. And I don't remember that necessarily being the case five years ago. Well, it's being pushed by the major outlets, yeah, because they are trying to keep up with what's going on around the city. And I got to say, some of it is just like grassroots stuff. We have an amazing team of musicians in the orchestra who are able to put a really high quality video product together. So like from day one, it's our second bassoonist. He's like this software genius. I mean, he's really great. He just said like, okay, here's what we're going to do if we want. He actually came in and filmed Conrad and Rob that day that we came in after we sh shut down. And he has, he was a photographer at Northwestern for the sports department there. So he has really big equipment. He was also an electrical engineering double major. So he has, he's just really good at all this. So he's been like the champion of this kind of stuff. So I think some of our virtual orchestra stuff sounds better than almost anyone. Um, Cause he just spends hours and hours and hours on it. It's a lot of time as an underappreciated thing about those four or five minute videos going across our screen and the amount of human labor that goes into making them happen. When we here in Rochester, when we were floating the idea, some people had some pretty ambitious plans and our librarian was just like, hold it. <laughs> That's not going to happen. I'll spend the rest of my life putting that together for you guys. And so we settled on something. We didn't settle. That's not the right word. But we, um, we chose something that was much more appropriate, both thematically and in terms of the technology we had. But speaking about the video content that you guys are producing, I'd like to ask you about the video content that you were a part of the morning after the protests. Well, yeah, it was, um, you know, it's been a tumultuous time in so many ways. And a bunch of us in Indy live downtown, um, right really close to where the protests were happening. And so that Friday, well, I had done, we were doing, when we were back to work under the payroll protection plan, um, we did these donor concerts where you would go around town and play in the driveways of donors and subscribers just as a way to stay connected to them. So there were protests and some damage to storefronts and stuff downtown on that Friday night. I was playing a donor concert on Massachusetts Avenue on Saturday afternoon and I turned around after I was done, you know, I, played my concert, it was really fun. I talked to the donors, turned around, saw a guy that I know walking down the street with two of his friends that I did not know. And I stopped to talk to him, you know, we're wearing masks and standing far apart. And, I, and um, the, the guys who were with him said something really racist, like violently racist. And I was aware of like, I don't know these guys. I'm with a younger woman from the development office who's next to me. We just need to not be here in this conversation now. So we just kind of left. But then she and I were talking about it afterwards and saying, well, that was really hard to hear. And it feels weird to walk away, but I don't want to confront this big guy that I don't know. But did, did we do the right thing? Anyway, so that had happened Saturday during the day. Saturday night, come home and literally heard all night long just noises that I couldn't identify, but kept thinking, I guess that's the sound of a tear gas canister gun being fired. I guess maybe that's a gunshot. I don't know what's going on downtown. I'm certainly not gonna walk the several blocks that I would need to to go see what's going on, but it sounds like there's violence happening for sure. And so Sunday morning, you know, I didn't really sleep much that night anyway, but I was up very early that morning and I thought, well, let me, turn on my phone and look and see if I can find out what did happen. So I went to the public radio website, I think, and they had these pictures of really like every storefront window along Washington Street smashed out. And I thought, well, that's our backstage door. That's our display window that lists all of our concerts behind it. That's um, the door that we walk through to get to every single rehearsal and every single concert. And I just, was worried about that. And then I was worried about my friends who live downtown. So I called this bassoonist that I mentioned earlier, who lives downtown with his wife and their daughter, who is I think two and a half years old. 
his wife is expecting a baby and I was just worried about them. And I, from the day before, from the conversation the day before, was thinking, well, what does an artist do in the face of racism and violence? What's the role of the artist in the community? And I thought, what I really want to do is I want to go take out my, my English horn and just play music for the people who are cleaning up and for, the, for Washington Street as it wakes up, as the sun's coming up. That feels like something that would feed me and feed anybody who happens to be walking by. So I called Mike to see if he was okay. He was, he was okay, but he lives even closer to where the big street violence was happening. He seemed shaken and I said, do you wanna come meet me backstage? And maybe um, I'm gonna improvise and if you want to. And he said, I don't wanna play my bassoon outside right now, but I'll film you. So that's what we did. We just met at the backstage door Sure enough, um, there was a window broken out that leads, used to be a door there and it leads into our basement. So the looters had just kind of run down into our basement and like smashed it, the TV or something, not, not much damage at all. And had broken the, that display window that lists all of our concerts behind it. So there's glass all over the place. And I just took out my instrument and started to improvise whatever came up. It was really beautiful because um, there were people that I know who were like on their bikes going by just to see what had happened and they would stop and listen. There were other people that I didn't know who were walking by. There were people um, coming to check on their small businesses next door to us. There were people sweeping up glass. Um, and so I just played my instrument, whatever came to mind. It was, it, it was powerful for me to do and... It, I was especially happy that like the people who were there to clean up ap appreciated it too. Um, so this whole time I've just I've been thinking, what is the role of the artist in the community? I do think that's one of them for sure is to provide um, a soundtrack for the city, um, to provide hope and healing, solace, um, or just I, what I said when, when I started is Mike said, Roger's gonna play something at our backstage where the windows have been shattered. He's gonna play a lament for the city. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm gonna play. Um, and then at the end of that, he, he just asked me, um, how do you decide which notes to play? And so we just had a little conversation about how I improvise and um, how an improviser experiences that. You mentioned in that video that there was some tie back to your former music director, Mario Gonzago. Can you uh, just shed a little light on that? Oh yeah, well it was, the, on that video I did two different improvs. The first one was like a blues based kind of thing. The second one, and then you know, I talked a little bit about the backstage windows and stuff. And then the second one I just started to play and actually one of my friends from around town was on her bike and she stopped right then. And um, I was also thinking about the improvs I had done on our donor driveway concerts the day before because what I would do on those is just ask people um, to name an emotion they were feeling or had been feeling and I would try to improvise that through sound and that's an exercise I do with my students and with myself so I started on an E flat and that is just because Mario Venzago I remember over and over with him. And I don't know if this is an actual thing or if it was just his concept, but he would talk about E flat as the note of death in German music. I have no idea if that's really a thing or not, but for him, it, it was. And so he would talk about E flat as a note signifying grief or mourning or death. So I just started on an E flat. I just held it. And then I started moving around in that key. Um, I started kind of E flat major ish, but I kept finding it going to E flat minor and E flat blues and diminished and, you know, less hopeful places. Um, and I just ended on a low E flat when it was all said and done. I try not to think too much when I'm doing those improvisations, but I try to give myself a structure sometimes. And that 
hearkening back to Mario too, is that when he was our conductor, those were the rehearsals and concerts, the most that I've ever been in any orchestra where, I mean, I would just be moved to tears in rehearsals time. I just think like, I can't believe the depth of emotion I'm feeling in a rehearsal. Um, Cause I just connected with him so deeply and so personally. So I just kind of felt him there while I was mm-hmm. doing it too. Yeah. This might sound a little naive, but it's something I've been reflecting on. Well, first I want to say that the cleanup efforts, I think across the country were kind of an affirming thing after a despairing night. And I think it's really special that you were able to contribute in something in another way besides a broom. (laughs) But one of the things I've been reflecting on since all this happened is how much leeway, I guess, I gave some of our political leadership in the sense that I glossed over things that were clearly shiny object chasing. And I think of Indianapolis as a city that has in some ways been really well run, sort of in a bipartisan way. When my first relationship with the city began maybe like 2004, 2005 when my wife moved there. And the the amount that the city has grown and improved. There's a book by um, Paul Katz, Bruce Katz, excuse me, who is former um, chief of staff for for housing and urban development. And he wrote this really fantastic book about called The New Localism. And Indianapolis is one of the real stars of that book, like in terms of that rebirth of downtown. First, I want to ask you, how do you feel that the orchestra um, participated in the renaissance, uh, the cultural renaissance, and the economic renaissance in downtown Indianapolis? Greatly, really greatly. We were one of the very first people to come back downtown. We moved back into our hall in 1984, which was long before much was going on downtown. You know, we have huge events downtown regularly. The whole month of December is a big downtown month. We have, we are very lucky to own a beautiful historic hall on Monument Circle in the middle of the city where for our Yuletide show, people walk through the circle of lights. It's the most magical. It's so beautiful. And then they walk into our beautiful old hall with wassail and cookies and it's a really signature experience and we were early to move downtown it was kind of controversial we played on the butler campus for a long time before that and moving downtown i think it was certainly before i was here but it was it was risky it was there was there was a sort of team of visionary civic leaders who Mm -hmm. built up white river state park and put in the canal downtown getting the orchestra back downtown was a big deal a big part of that as a a signal and a symbol that it would be you know safe to be downtown and good and a good idea to come downtown on a weekend night and do some cool art things downtown and by the time i moved here in 95 you know there was a burgeoning art gallery scene downtown and you could feel it kind of expanding outwards. Indianapolis is designed with these diagonals that go off of that main circle. And a couple of those you'd go like, oh, so Massachusetts Avenue has more art galleries and now Fountain Square has more art galleries. And you could feel the, the whole arts community coming in around it more and more. So the orchestra was an early part of that for sure and continues to be a real anchor of the art scene right in the middle of the city. Did the did the pop series that is so robust now and so good, did that build up after the move downtown? Was Jack the architect of that of that whole pop series? Well when I joined Eric Kunzel was still our mm. pops music director and Eric did Cincinnati and then would basically just repeat the same program he had just done there with us. So it felt like we did not have a signature Pops series, but it was pretty well attended. In fact, it was very well attended because they were good. You know, Eric was famous. So we basically Mm -hmm. just did almost his his exact same concerts one week later, often with our orchestra. And um, Jack Everly definitely changed it. I mean, it, it became much more our concerts. Uh, We started the Symphonic Pops Consortium, which was a really great thing, but we would create in-house these beautifully done 
really elaborate, gorgeous concerts where we do the costumes and the casting and the script and you name it. And then we would franchise those out to Pittsburgh and Seattle and all over the country. Um, so Jack and his team did that for sure. And that has kept going. I mean, they, that's still a thing. So definitely when Jack Everly took over, I wish I could tell you the date, maybe it was around 2000 or 2004 when Jack became our pop's music director. Again, incredibly lucky because Jack is from here. He went to Indiana University. He lives here. So he's very connected to the community and very active in building a pops and Yuletide and film series with us. Yeah, it just seems that the orchestra does so much and it does it so well that you serve a really broad spectrum of people from the city and the county. Um, and as the tech industry moved into town and a lot of younger folks started moving downtown in these brand new apartments that were being built all over the place. When I came back from Louisville, I would literally think that, oh, that building wasn't there when I left <laughs> to go to work on Tuesday morning. <laughs> on Thursday afternoon, here's the new apartment building. Um, yep. And then the Happy Hour series you guys developed kind of filled that niche too. Can you tell me a little bit about that? For sure. Well, you know, that's another example of a really, it's really amazing to watch things happen. The first year of that, it was not well done because it was brand new and we were just kind of taking a guess at what could we do to have some, you know, there were other orchestras like San Francisco and New York were doing like rush hour concerts, something for you work here in the city and before you go home or you're young and here's something to do that like five o'clock or six o'clock. We started those. I remember the first year they would sell like 25 tickets total or 60 tickets total because number one, nobody knew what it was. And number two, we were just kind of doing programming from our weekly classical concert and just sort of pulling out one piece and putting it on a five o'clock concert. Well, that's not, a, that's not a different product for anybody to come and experience. So that was really when Time for Three started to take over that series more. They got a, it, in, in conjunction with a few other young conductors and other people who started to say, well, what if we really did this hybrid pops, contemporary music orchestra, but with a guest artist or a jazz group or a rapper or any number of things. One of our big, one of the most popular kinds of those concerts most recently has been Steve Hackman does those pieces where he will take a classical piece and a pop artist or piece and put them together and weave them together. We did Brahms one and Radiohead, those kinds of things. Um, and so Steve curates that series for us now on an ongoing basis. And they're really cool and they attract a lot of people who never come to anything else. And we have tons of food and beverage sponsors and theatrical lighting. And it's a really cool, good series that, again, I was thinking about this, this in the past couple of months. There's this fail fast concept sometimes that if you try something and it doesn't work well, just pull the plug on it right away. If it doesn't work, don't keep trying it. And when that comes up in our orchestra conversations, I'll say, okay, we can say that, but let's talk about happy hour. Literally, I remember talking to our communications director at the time that first year, and she said, you guys, I don't know how we can keep doing this. It sells 25 tickets, but it's not feasible. And then, you know, we all said, well, it might be feasible, but we probably have to program it really differently. It can't just be here's Beethoven 6. I mean, we could actually do Beethoven 6 with like cool narration describing the piece and talking about this is a brook and this is a bird and whatever. Yeah, that would be different, but it's not a children's concert either. So that fail fast mentality, sometimes in the arts, is not necessarily the best one. Sometimes it is, well, this is a great idea. Let's cultivate it. Yeah, you just need the, the right foundation. But I think to your point, the happy hour of today is um, unrecognizable from where it started. And that, took, that takes courage, too. And I think, too, that um, in a post-vaccine world, too, that 
the partnerships that you alluded to with the food scene might be a really valuable thing. I mean, to try help everyone get back on their feet. Sure. Well, you know, one of our big corporations in the city now is Salesforce. And I've been thinking a lot about, well, how do we tap into the Salesforce corporate culture and corporate vibe and get more of that body of workers and of downtown residents and downtown folks involved with us? And this, that's the kind of a program, the kind of a thing that I think does appeal more to that. But you really have to look at who's around and what do they want and what do they like and where are they going to... Um, what kinds of projects are going to attract corporate and individual funding and excitement and be satisfying for the orchestra to do all at the same time. And they are, they are definitely out there. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned Mario Gonzaga a little bit ago, and you mentioned that you guys are in a music director search. How many music directors have you worked for in the ISO and who hired you? Raymond Leppard hired me and then, Mario followed him, and then Christoph Urbanski followed him. So that is it, three. Raymond um, had been with the orchestra, I think, for 12 years or so when I was hired. Um, very different identity for the orchestra at the time. He was very into a lot of chamber orchestra size pieces, lots of Mozart and Haydn and Sch Schubert, um, occasionally Brahms and Tchaikovsky, but not much after that unless it was Elgar or Vaughan Williams. Mario, of course, did a lot of big German rep, big um, Shostakovich. We did a really cool Rheingold one time. I really he loved Bruckner. And Christoph does a lot of Central European, Czech, again, Russian stuff. He likes big, likes big works. So it's been nice to get to experience a big variety like that, too. But just those three. After the, all those years and those three leaders... I mean, do you have a sense or how would you describe the artistic identity, particularly the classical identity of the ISO? Well, I think it has changed with, with each of them. And I think that's part of what they're asked to do is develop a signature identity or a signature sound that they're going for. I'll say right now, because we're in this transition period, it's, that's a hard to define quality. I think we're a body of very good players, really good. And we have a lot of young players. We have a, we've had this like demographic shift over the last few years, just because every, we had a large group of people who all came into the orchestra at around the same time. And so they're all turning 65 or 68 or 60 and just saying like, it's time to retire, I think. So we have a lot of new, mm -hmm. new people coming in. So right now it's, I think that's the job of the next music director is to take this body of incredible artists and help us shape into a new artistic identity. Mm -hmm. The last few years that I was close to you guys, I um, was working for the Louisville Orchestra where we had a shining light of a music director. And it was always such a contrast to come up and work with you guys every now and again. And just remember this other kind of institution, which executes at such a high level from top to bottom and um, across all the series. And so we've talked a lot about the artistic execution of the ISO and that, that piece of the puzzle, I think you guys have really well dialed in and that's really um, a great thing to behold. But I wanna ask you about your own history of activism and how that might inform the other piece of the puzzle, the community service piece of the puzzle as the orchestra reassembles, um, however and whenever that happens. Yeah, I mean, for me, that's certainly in the last several months, that's been the big question. I have done a lot of education concert stuff. I used to host children's concerts in every orchard that I've been in. I've hosted and written narrations and done all sorts of stuff like that, both in this orchestra and in the, the two before it. And um, we have like a series of concerts in the libraries. One of our second violinists has written a bunch of beautiful children's books and we do those in, in the libraries. And I actually feel and find that the orchestra musicians playing those connect to their hearts and spirits in a different way. You can watch people really love the little kids in the audience and really enjoy playing these pieces together and doing the motions where like, this is the sun coming up and these are the trees waving in, in the breeze. And so when I watch my colleagues play things like that, even I think, you know, 
we could do more of this. And it would probably be a great idea for us to be more just directly involved in the community that way or whatever way. I mean, playing in schools or community centers or libraries or churches or whatever. That's a big shift in terms of that is not all of us sitting on stage playing a giant work together. That's being a lot smaller and adaptable. And certainly in the social distancing time, that's about all we are going to be able to do is smaller groups or groups in various settings where we can do some really interesting and attractive things like that. So I think there's a huge opportunity to be very creative with this kind of concept of who are we in relation to the city and to the community. Um, I've done tons of activism and worked on a lot of political campaigns. Really, since college, I was in ACT UP and a bunch of other AIDS organizations back in the 80s. I worked at the Dallas AIDS Resource Center in college. So I was involved with ACT UP and just various LGBT rights groups throughout time. And you're right, that has been a sort of missing piece of, I would love to connect more with like, social justice activism and music in a way that has heart and resonance. And I think most of my colleagues would too. It could be a variety, and it's not political necessarily, it's personal. It's um, like, I, I play at a festival in Virginia every summer that inevitably at that festival, I'll play some piece that I'll think, wow, well, this is the most exciting thing I've done all year because it'll be like, a piece for just me and an electronic track with narration of World War I letters home from a soldier to his mother. And I'm on stage alone listening to like gunshots and whistles and soundtrack and these words and I'm playing along with it and I've got it memorized and I'm moving and I connect with the audience in this really powerful way that's what I think orchestra musicians, if we were given the access and the training and the comfort to do it, like we're a bunch of really talented people who, if we could create works like that and send us all over the city, amazing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's possible to do that for sure. There would be funding to do that. There would be excitement about that. I mean, I have all sorts of ideas of creating anti-racism works that we could take into the schools, individual works that, you know, if you're a violinist who loves to cook, we could write a piece about food and about cooking and you could take it all around town too. There's a million opportunities for us. And that may be the direction that orchestra, orchestras need to go to get their musicians more and more um, connected personally to the works that they play and they get into the city more. I'm not sure though. Yeah. So this brings up a bunch of things that I want to, I want to hit with you because I'm just genuinely curious for myself and, and for the listeners too. Um, so on one hand, there's like the activism and the real on the ground work with people. And there's an artistic side. And of course there, those things can be conjoined. And I've been thinking for a long time before COVID that the orchestra's secret weapon or its most important aspect is that it's big. Its bigness is its most important point because we can get to a lot of people and a lot of people were aware of us. And in order for us to be better, we have to get to more people, which means we have to grow. And so I am a pro growth union member <laughs> and Obviously, we've been stopped in our tracks with that. And I think that there is some getting back to first principles um, that we're going to all have to go through. And perhaps in diminished circumstances, some of the reimbursement we get, some of the compensation we get will be morale boosting, right? So maybe the, the stuff in the, in the halls. So I want to talk to, or in the libraries, you were saying. So I want to ask you a little bit more, push you a little bit more on that side of this equation, the, the social justice side, the activism side, how political can an orchestra get? How political can the orchestra musicians get? I'm not saying campaigning for a candidate, but I mean like talk about relevant issues 
that are that are impactful and meaningful, but maybe perhaps not consensus, but conflictual sure. issues in our in our population. Go for it, Roger. Amen, brother. I mean, this is exact. This is like we're right at this point of dissonance, and some of it's generational. I think too. Some of it is um, where are we abundant, and where are we s- s- scarce? Like, where do we have abundance? Um, what do we do that's based out of love and courage and what do we do that's based out of fear or there's not enough um so just a part of what we have to balance always in an orchestra is most members of the board and lots of subscribers are older and probably more conservative in their in their musical tastes and maybe more conservative in their political leanings hard to know sometimes yes sometimes no so we don't want to offend anyone Mm -hmm. but I've been on the ISO's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and we've really done some good work on that front. Uh, of course, every orchestra is trying to do that. And we did a, an anti-racism all-day workshop for all the arts people in the city. We sent a bunch of people to a two-day anti-racism course that was really powerful and really good. And we are just right before the shutdown, literally I had a, a diversity committee meeting that week that we did on Zoom because we couldn't do it face to face. We had started talking about what's our mission statement and what are the projects we want to get going. So we were just starting that. And mm-hmm. I was thinking all along, you know, this is going to offend some people. But if as an institution, we commit to well, wait a second, who is it going to offend to be an anti-racist institution? If we're saying we're offending like racists who might come to concerts, we can't worry about that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Even like doing something for the Gay Pride Parade or Gay Pride Festival, I pitched that a long time ago in like 2000. And the answer was, "Uh, I don't think we want to do that. We might offend people. But then by the time Gary Gensling was here and the Pulse nightclub shooting happened we had a concert in their honor like the next day with rainbow lights in the lobby (laughs) it was fully like well we don't care if we offend anyone actually i don't think he'll mind me telling this when gay marriage was getting legalized you know in one state or one jurisdiction after the other the county clerk here in indianapolis started doing weddings right away as soon as she thought she could like kind of before the the state could tell her that she couldn't so i know her she goes to our church and so i i just called her up and said hey could we like put a string quartet together and make cool signs and come and play for people while they wait and she said are you kidding i would love that i would love that so much and then i thought oh i should ask gary gensling our CEO at the time, again, with this idea of like, is it too controversial? Is it going to offend anybody? And he had the perfect answer. He said, oh, that's a beautiful idea. Um, it might offend somebody, but I don't care. Those are the kinds of people we don't need. So there has to be in an institution a certain kind of boldness. If, if we want to attract young members of the board, if we want to keep young members of the board, if we want to keep younger audiences, if we want to keep and change and become vibrant and address again who's what's the role of the artist citizen it's that Mm -hmm. i think and it it doesn't have to i said this earlier it doesn't have to be political you could easily create a program about something that most people would view as very politically conservative that a politically conservative member of the orchestra could go do at a conservative church group somewhere you can do that kind of thing too there's not one way or the other it's finding what's personal and expressing it through the art in a way that connects to the needs of the city Mm -hmm. and so let's go look at the artistic side a little bit now so you've found a new voice or uh, augmented your voice in this festival in stanton virginia yeah and uh it's a big big part of your season unfortunately i assume it's canceled this summer it is. I just made a video for them yesterday. <laughs> Are they going through with any kind of digital campaign for this, like to a digital festival or something like that? No, what, what, 
what we're doing is um, they've asked the like core Stanton family. I played there for 10 years and um, that festival, if you want to talk about growth, that place is amazing. The first year I went was as an audience member in 2008. And it really was like string quartet, piano, like a guest clarinetist. I forget the number this last year, but it was like 200 of us doing it this, this past year. I mean, you have early instruments, classical instruments, modern instruments, percussion, singers, you know, it's just, it's a huge thing now. So um, we're not doing any virtual concerts this year, but we have a really great videographer who's done a bunch. He, he films everything. So they're showing videos from past years and they're having us give introductions to them to talk about the experience of preparing the piece. One of the great things about Stanton is they always have a composer or two or three there writing new works for that festival. Often it will be a composer from the Netherlands or Germany. There's a lot of, um, the guy who founded it is German. And so he has a lot of, a lot of connections there. And the players are mostly um, East Coast people with a few people from France, Netherlands, Finland, Germany who come over to do it. And it's, um, so we're just talking about those works. So I just did, my video was on, wait, wait for it. It's the kind of thing you never get to do anywhere. A sonata for oboe and piano and male chorus who are embedded in the audience, who stand during the last movement and sing the names of gay victims of the Nazis. And so, you know, it's an incredibly powerful piece mm -hmm. that, you know, for me personally, I loved to play. And again, feeds my heart and my creative imagination in a way that very few other pieces do. So I just did my video in introduction to that performance. And then they're going to show the video of my performance of that from 2018. I think it's worth pointing out that Stanton is kind of an interesting place in itself. I mean, it's, I used to live in Virginia almost 20 years ago or 20 years ago or so. And um, it's tucked out there in the Shenandoah Valley, pretty far west of um, Richmond. And it's got a, the Heifetz Festival is there, the like kind of a yep. hot shot string camp. The Shakespeare Festival is there with the full <laughs> reproduction of the Globe Theater, the Blackfriars Theater. And Woodrow Wilson was born there. <laughs> I know. And, but uh, uh, it was the capital of Virginia during the revolution when Richmond got run over. So, yeah, it's this crazy town where you, the first time I went, I, I said, is this a movie set? Like, what right. is this town? <laughs> it is this idyllic, beautiful, and it's in the mountains. And, you know, it has enough retired DC, you know, it's close enough mm -hmm. to DC that That's there's what I was enough. Ask. Yeah, there's enough old money there and enough. But I got to say, it's just appreciation. Well, what Karsten did there, it was brilliant and great. He used to teach at Mary Baldwin College, which is also there. Again, this idyllically beautiful college. And he wanted to do a chamber music festival, but he loves contemporary music and he wanted to really sort of challenge audiences. So he would just put things on a concert that you normally would be told you can't do. And over time, the audiences grew to understand a little more deeply and then a little more deeply again. And sometimes after concerts, I'm talking to audience members who will say, boy, that Ligeti piece, I hated that. Or I didn't understand that at all. Or that Ernst Krennic thing, I didn't, can you explain that to me? And they're genuinely curious. And there's enough interaction from audience and community and the artists. Like we stay in their homes, we go out to eat with them. That over time it's turned into we can program almost anything we want there and people will at least appreciate it or give it the time of day. Mm -hmm. um, I've never played as much George Crumb in my life as I do there. And audiences look forward to it. Mm -hmm. We have larger crowds when we do really interesting work. Yeah, you know, I play in the Cabrillo Festival in Santa Cruz in the summertime and that's obviously a new music festival. And... Um, a couple summers ago, my mom came out and spent the two weeks with me and Louise. She came to all the concerts, obviously. And her takeaway, I mean, she's, she's a pretty sophisticated listener, but you know, the average chair music concerts in Charleston, South Carolina aren't 
<laughs> doing these kind, this kind of music. And her reaction was so observant about what was happening on stage, just the way people were working together and just the interaction. I mean, there's so much heavy lifting goes in to getting a new piece off the ground in a very short amount of time that I think that that teamwork is more evident than it is when you come to see a Brahms symphony in the big hall. How has that experience informed you as a member of the ISO? Well, you know, it's probably informed me as a teacher more mm. um, because, you know, being in a major orchestra is playing masterworks. I mean, it certainly makes me much more comfortable and confident on contemporary works because the stuff I play in the summer is so much more outrageous or challenging or with extended techniques or actually working with a composer on what the instrument's capable of doing. So if we have anything contemporary at the ISO at all, to me, it feels like, well, this is not a big challenge compared to what I have learned to do every summer. So, and I, and I will have colleagues occasionally who will say, well, how are you analyzing the seven against five thing here? How are you doing that so easily? And I'll just be able to explain it very quickly because I do it on a more regular basis. It definitely affects my teaching more because I'm much more able and confident and comfortable um, teaching extended techniques or working, I think, more like a, a, a composer thinks now. Like I, I tend to find myself thinking motivically or structurally in a way that I didn't before I started playing in Stanton in the summers. And so as a general musician, I would say it, it's affected me more freer maybe too. I'm more, I don't know, that's, that's not true. I've always been a very kind of heart-based expressive player, but I, I think I'm more able to unify that side of my playing with more beautiful technical polish. I think I used to separate those. Like I was either free or I was clean. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, think, I think now I'm better at doing both. So here's a good uh, chance to pivot. You brought up your students. So you teach at Indiana University. Uh, just briefly describe what your studio looks like. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm super lucky to be there. I have a halftime position there. So what that means is I have an in, in, incredible full-time colleague who is the most devoted creative teacher I can think of. So she and I work very closely together to cultivate a oboe studio family. We really do that. We, we want them to be friends. Uh, we want them to support each other and be competitive in a healthy way. So what I do is I teach, I have a sort of broad mix of students. I teach English horn class. I teach a a uh, eurythmics class to the oboe studio on a regular basis. I, we team teach the weekly Thursday master class. So I teach probably a third of those, I would say. And that's usually an orchestral rep class or a getting ready for auditions class. I prepare a lot of students for taking auditions. That's a big part of what I do there. And I teach a lot of education majors and composers and double majors. So my students go on to become doctors and lawyers, band directors, composers, music theorists, and some of them win major orchestral jobs. So I have a very broad array of the kinds of students that I teach there. And we really work hard in the oboe studio to keep a broad representation and a very high standard at the same time. Mm -hmm. So maybe we divide this question into pre-coronavirus and post-coronavirus, but I'm curious about some of your thoughts around the audition process, both uh, how you teach it, but also as a member of a committee. I'm curious about your candid appraisal of this process. Well, I remember when I was on the audition circuit, getting really good at it by seeing it as um, not a game exactly, but kind of I, it took me a while to understand what exactly they're looking for. And I needed to work with a few expert audition teachers before I could get that. And once I got it, I kind of thought, oh, okay, now I know what to do and I'll advance every time. And so I did, I got to a point where I did, but I took a bunch of auditions where I didn't advance at all. And was just thinking, I think I'm really good. And like, I, I sound good on concerts. What, what am I not doing right at, at, at auditions? So, there is a learning curve. So as a teacher, I spent a lot of time talking about that, of 
well, look, it sounds really personal and beautiful, but that's slightly out of time and that's slightly out of tune and that isn't really clean there. So we just have to address that first. So it's a, you have to have a specific skill set that you're able to execute in tune, in time, don't miss anything. And that can take a really long time to be able to do those three things. So usually, depending on the level of the student, I'm working with them on that quite a bit on, um, let's get out the metronome again, let's get out the tuner again, let's put this with the harmonic context again, and then let's build out what's the character you want to convey here so that you don't come in third or fourth, but you come in first. So that if you, we start with the character, then as the Jesuits say, we descend into the particulars and we look at every little thing and then we go back out. I call it big picture, little picture, big picture. We go back out to, okay, you've solved all of this and it sounds very clean and very accurate and very good. Now, what's the story that you're gonna tell here? So surfing on an audition committee, and I've done that many, many times, I try to listen with both. I try to listen with, is this a musician that I'm drawn into? And can I think of what the other committee members or I am holding up this sort of basic music values? Um, do I like this tone? Do I trust this person's pitch? Do I relate to that sound? So I wanna sit next to it. Do I trust this person's rhythm? Because it is all out of context. So the audition process is very strange because that you're playing out of context. So you have to show a lot of context as much as possible. I don't think it's a perfect process, but I do find that if the committee, and this is really crucial because many do not do this, if the audition committee talks beforehand about core values, what we see, who we identify, with like what kind of player do we want and what does that mean for each of us and if we if we have a conversation about that then we end up hiring someone that we're very happy with and we've done that over and over and over you're a product of the legendary john mack and so did you leave school with a fully formed idea of how to do this and just had to take some time to get it get under your belt i mean we're so some of this some of this learning process for you must have happened when you were in charleston or when you were in honolulu yeah uh for sure i left cleveland being incredibly good at imitating my teacher basically <laughs> and and having much much better rhythm than i did when i got there because cleveland teaches dal crow's Eurythmics classes, and I was obsessed with those. I love those those classes. So I just used the Eurythmics stuff and the John Mack, no, this excerpt has to sound like this, and push those together as much as I could to say like, okay, I didn't advance at that audition because they said I wasn't counting. So let me make sure that I have great rhythm and let me internalize and put into movement, which for me is very personal. I love to dance and I was a dancer in high school. So movement really helps me to I internalize music. Um, so I did a lot of that stuff. And John Mack was an incredible teacher in terms of bringing out your personality and giving you a lot of tools for how individual excerpts needed to sound to win an audition. So I played English horn when I went to Charleston, but it was a second oboe job and English horn was optional. I didn't even own one. I used Mr. Max English horn to win that job. I didn't own my own instrument, but I got there and you know, John Mack, if nothing else was savvy. And he said, look, Roger, I'm just gonna read the list of major English horn jobs that are gonna open up in the next five or six years. And he went down the list and it was a huge list. It was like, all the major orchestras in the country. And he said, you're pretty good at English horn, you like it, and there's a lot of opportunity there and not a lot of specialists doing it. I think you should get a really good instrument, start making those reads, and in Charleston, whenever you can play it, play it. So I did that. And it, and it, was a, it is a more um, immediately personal, natural voice for me than the oboe my hands fit it a little bit better. My, the way that I blow kind of works better on English horn. That's probably far too technical, but it's just sort of 
um, stuff that on the oboe was hard to do on the English horn for me was less hard to do. Interesting. So I want to circle back to then how you got started. So you grew up in Texas and you grew up in the church. Yep. And so probably around a lot of music. Yeah, my dad was a church choir director. I was a boy soprano. I sang a mall in the night visitors when I was like 10 years old. Yeah, I grew up singing. My family still sings whenever we get together. Um, absolutely, it's just like music was everywhere. And so I started oboe in sixth grade. I started piano when I was four, I think. And so I started oboe in sixth grade and I'm from Louisville, which is a Dallas, it's like an exurb kind of, it's about 40 miles out. It has a great band department there. I mean, a huge band, public school program. And so it was competitive and fun and, and intense and tons of opportunity. And crucially, 15 or 20 miles south of Denton, which is home to the University of North Texas. So it had also access to great grad students and or the people who taught there as our instructors. So I started with a North Texas grad student as my very first teacher, and she was incredibly good. And then I started taking with the, the professor at North Texas in like eighth or ninth grade. So I just, again, was in a really good public school band program started happened to be really close to a really good teacher and then was in the fort worth youth orchestra from ninth grade through the 12th grade and then junior and senior years of high school went to the dallas arts called um booker t washington high school for the performing and visual arts it used to be called the arts magnet when i was there and boy talk about transformational amazing that place was amazing how so? I mean, I'd love to hear about that. Oh, well, I, I described it even at the time as, well, I went from being kind of like hated at my high school for like, you're gay and you play oboe, ooh, <laughs> to like, you're gay and you play oboe? Oh my God. <laughs> we love you. You're, the, you're like the godsend. Wow, we have a great oboe player and he's really flamboyant and fun. And like, it, I went from being like beloved, it, like into this beautiful magical atmosphere and I suddenly had all these friends who were like jazz singers and poets and jewelers and modern dancers and it felt like a dream there used to be a show called fame based on fame the movie and I watched that show obsessively and just dreamt of if there's a high school like that a performing arts high school that I could ever go to and then I found out there was one and I was able to go to it so Going there, it felt like I was living in a dream world, kind of, because it was just every day this incredible, creative, cool stuff, and we would play just all day. And I got to take jazz classes and improv workshops, and John Cage came, and Wenton came, and yeah, it was just like a parade of incredible music and art influences. And we literally were just asked, as like in your academic courses, you know, I want you to write a paper about the 1880s and tie it to something going on in the art, in your art at that time. So it'd be like, I guess I'll research McDowell because I don't know any other American composers from 1880, but let me do, or like write a paper about um, Aaron Copeland and John Steinbeck. And so I was doing that while then being asked to like improvise while a dancer danced and just play movements that I saw him do try to make a sound that looks like his body as it's moving. So it was an incredible place for me to blossom and grow and be both intellectually and artistically fed at the same time. I'm not sure if you said this, but did you find the school or did your folks find it for you? Well, I wanted to go there in the ninth grade, audition in the eighth grade and they accepted me. And my, my mom and dad very practically and probably wisely said, we don't think we want you commuting into Dallas every day for four years, starting when you're 14 years old. I just, you know, they, and, and they also said, we really think getting an academic education in Louisville for at least the first two years of high school is a better idea than specializing in the oboe this early. My dad was incredibly practical, even all the way through grad school about saying, um, how many jobs are there in the oboe in the orchestra business? And are you sure you're competitive? And are you sure you're on the right track to do this? And if not, you know, maybe 
think about going to law school or maybe think about majoring in something else in grad school. So we actually, you know, I went to major summer festivals starting my freshman year of, of undergrad in part because I kind of had to prove to my dad that I was good enough to get into those. His whole attitude was like, if you're not already nationally competitive, mm -hmm. you got to kind of make the case here. So I went to Chautauqua my freshman year in National Repertory Orchestra my sophomore year and those kinds of things all along the way um, because my dad was right. I mean, it is really hard. You have to be at the very, very, very top of an elite group to get one of these jobs. And so my grad school thing really literally was, it's going to sound crazy. I would never advise one of my students to do this. It was either I'm getting in with John Mack, my dream teacher, and going to Cleveland, or I'm going to pivot and do something else. I probably would have gone to law school. So that was your metric. So you probably didn't have a whole lot of self-doubt, but you knew that if that didn't work out, that was the sign. Yeah, and you know, I was also n not a dumb kid, and I went to the Grand Tetons Festival to work with John Mack two summers before that. I, I, I got to know him. I went to Cleveland for lessons. So when I showed up at my audition, he said, Roger, it's so good to see you. I'm so excited to hear this. And I had auditioned for him for undergrad and not gotten in, but had a conversation with him then where he said, I don't think I'm going to be able to take you, but you should go to SMU and study with Eric and make sure you come play for me and make sure you come to the Tetons and make sure you... So, you know, I was kind of all along the way keeping my eyes on, and then I'm going to go to Cleveland, right? And so that's what I did. So how did you begin this love affair with John and Max playing as a, at that age? Like, was it just the recordings? Yeah. Or did... Okay, so you just were, you were listening to a lot of Cleveland Orchestra recordings. No, actually, it's, it's even better than that. I was at Baylor Summer Band Camp when I was, I don't know, 13, 14. I don't know. It's, it seems like I was a little tiny kid. I might have been older. I might have been like junior in high school. But the teacher at Baylor, Doris Deloach, gave us a listening list and said, these are oboe players that you, would, that you really need to know. And you can go to the Baylor music library it's right here in this building and you can check them out and you can listen to them and i was the kind of kid who thought oh that'd be great i should go do that so i remember i mean i went to the baylor library checked out a john mack album and lp put it on the turntable dropped the needle and just couldn't believe what i was hearing i mean started crying mm -hmm. just like this is an oboe like i just i, I didn't know that it could do that and it could sound like that. And so from that instant on, it was just, I gotta, I gotta meet this guy, I have to play with him. I need to, he needs to be my major teacher and mentor and I'll do what I need to do to make that happen. And that's not an exaggeration. It really felt like from the minute I heard him. So then once I had heard that, yes, the Cleveland Orchestra, <laughs> I, listened, I bought everything I could, I listened to everything that I could and I just um, knew I wanted to work with him. So you were doing a lot of deep listening into classical recordings and orchestral recordings, but you mentioned a little earlier that you were surrounded by incredibly vibrant folks in this performing arts school. So did you, I mean, I know that now you have pretty eclectic tastes. Um, was that at the same true as a high, was that true as a high school kid? Um, yeah, in a way, I, I would say, you know, so much of high school was just um, learning orchestral rep stuff and learning woodwind rep stuff and learning oboe rep stuff so I just wanted to explore classical music as much as I could I took like jazz improv classes and stuff at Arts Magnet because we had an incredible jazz jazz group there an incredible jazz conductor there and a great jazz legacy there so I took some of that and I kind of worked with it and I played we did a there was an, a professional improvisation group in Dallas at the time and they had a residency with us. So I started improvising with them then. Um, seems like those were on weekends. I think I came back into Dallas on Saturdays to do improv workshops with them. Um, so eclectic, yeah, but really in high school, it was just learn the kind of basic rep. After the listening assignments were done, after you got your fill of the, the George Zell collection, were you listening to a broad spectrum of things? Or was no. It okay. I was listening to like air supply. I was okay. listening to just well, like bubblegum, happy pop.
pop. I just want a boyfriend, you know, that. And, and then, well, and I mean, and like the gayest possible things I have I, in my record collection at that time would have been like Liza Minnelli, Barbara Streisand, Bette Midler, all the gay icons. I don't know how, like I had a Judy Garland album collection that I started when I was 13. I don't know how I knew that was some kind of a gay thing. Well, and you know, this is, this is however, this is very true. This did influence me. Lots of singers uh, that definitely, because of my dad, I think mostly, but we had lots of opera, lots of singers. And I had a lot of like Mahalia Jackson and Aretha Franklin I had a lot of soul singers and R&B singers and lots of opera. So that probably informed my playing more than anything else in terms of the way of playing that I really still try to do, which is as vocal as possible. Well, that's, I think it was a pretty good place to wrap up. But before we finish and on that sentiment and in that sentiment, what recommendations might you have to listen to or read or anything, that, anything that's captured your imagination recently? Recently, I've been listening to lots of podcasts because I don't sleep as much as I did before the COVID shut, shut down. So I'd have this like, okay, well, I seem to be awake at 2.30 or 3.30 in the morning. So let me listen to Richard Rohr and Brene Brown. And I, I'm at this place in my life that I was already doing before the shutdown, but about um, what is it like to be an elder? What is it like to be mature and a mentor and a guide. And I've been reading Richard Rohr anyway about first half of life and second half of life. So I've been listening to his podcasts a lot over the last couple of months um, and kind of trying to explore more the spirituality of living in liminal space right now, living in the in-between. The old is washed away and the new is not visible yet. And I've been reading books about grief. Some I've reread Joan Didion. <laughs> I talk about an incredibly powerful book, The Year of Magical Thinking. I just reread Said Jones. Um, it's called um, How We Fight for Our Lives. Boy, if you haven't read that, Rob, I mean, run, don't walk. That, and, and wait for it. Said Jones is from Louisville, Texas. Wow. He's from my little weird hometown. So I read How We Fight for Our Lives last fall, and it blew my mind. It's a, he's an incredible writer. You can tell that he was a poet before he wrote fiction as well. So it's achingly beautiful. It's a coming-of-age story. It's a memoir, I guess, too. And then I, I just reread that last month. Um, and I've actually reached out to him to see if I could pull an excerpt from that book to put into an oboe and fix media piece that I want to commission for next year. So that's what I've been reading lately. I've just, um, I started um, Mark Brackett. I don't know if you know him. It's a, he, t he talks about emotional language and having a broader um, spectrum of definitions for our emotions and trying to teach emotional learning as a part of grade school curriculum also. So I've been, you know, just in my efforts to like, as an educator and as a person trying to teach students about emotion and art. his point in the book, it's a really amazing book, is about um, we don't teach that. We don't teach emotional intelligence or emotional understanding and we have a limited vocabulary for it. So, um, so I've been reading stuff like that lately. The most, I mean, the Blow Your Mind book is Saeed Jones, for sure. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. This is great. Thank you for listening. The music on the show, as always, is by Louisville, Kentucky-based guitar virtuoso Craig Wagner. And there's more information about Craig in the show notes. We'll be back soon with more interviews, so please go ahead and hit subscribe. <laughs>